Lord, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the chance to uh, just be encouraged as we get into the Word of God and uh, this specific passage in the book of Philippians. And Lord, I pray that uh, we will not miss uh, whatever you have for us to learn today, Lord, that we would be open to just uh, how the, the Spirit of God is going to work in a powerful way. So, Lord, use Greg in a mighty way for your glory. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Can you hear me okay? Everything's good? All right. Um, it, whether you know it or not, I, honestly, in a good way, we use our Tuesday guys as a guinea pig, uh, <laughs> kind of gauge our, our time and uh, some of that stuff. So I, I've got a, um, th- this is a new one for me, guys. We're looking at seven verses in one day. That's, uh, that's stretching me. Um, that's a little nuts, but uh, we're going to give it a shot anyway. So uh, uh, I thought about getting you guys on about 530 this morning and starting, but <clears throat> we'll see what we can do uh, getting going now. So I'm going to read uh, this passage and um, we'll get into it. So we're in Philippians chapter one still. Uh, if you don't have your notes, I have put it into the chat. Uh, you can always go there. You can print it off. It's a Word document. Um, some of you got it yesterday from Rod and actually printed it off. So, but if you don't have that, if you got, you got your Bible handy, Philippians chapter one, uh, verses 15 through 21. So this is what Paul says. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former Proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now that last part is a very, very familiar passage uh, to uh, most of us, if not all of us. And this passage really as a whole Uh, like so many others, but this one really speaks so much, I think, to Paul's maturity as a follower of Christ. We just get another look into who he is. Uh, It speaks not only to his credibility or to his maturity, but also his credibility and his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So here's your first uh, fill-in. There were some men who were preaching the true, which is the fill-in, They were preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ, but some of them were doing so at Paul's personal expense. They were doing so while they were maligning Paul and his ministry in the process, if you can believe that. He says in verse 15 that some were preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry. So he's saying that Some of them were preaching Christ, yes, but they were preaching it almost out of jealousy of him. Now, if we we just paraphrase verse 18, we go down a few verses there, which is honestly where I thought we would probably end today originally. But if we just paraphrase that, it might sound something like this if Paul were actually speaking to us. He would say, so what if so what if some preach with wrong motives? So what if some are overly interested in themselves? So what if there are some who take unfair shots at me? What matters is this. Christ is being preached. And that thought alone intensifies my joy. That might be what he says, because that's basically a paraphrase of verse 18. I mean, 
if you go back to the last time uh, I taught and we were in verses 12 through 14, you'll remember I talked about the fact that Paul sees advantages in the midst of the most disadvantageous situations in life. We tend to uh, look at it differently. Uh, some of you don't. Some of you, you're very optimistic. You look at that, but many people don't. So here's your second feeling. Again, it's all about perspective. Here are some guys that are that are uh, uh, um, they're coming at at Paul hard. They are detractors of Paul, and yet they are preaching the gospel. And he wasn't he wasn't worried about it. I put in your notes. For Paul, if the truth of the gospel was being preached, he wasn't worried about the motive. That's your feeling. He wasn't worried about the motive. He was just grateful that Jesus Christ was being preached soundly. Now, this is kind of a unique situation because there was a time, if you remember, where Paul wasn't all that uh, hip and he wasn't that joyful about what others preached. In fact, his advice to the Galatians, if you remember, was to let certain false teachers be uh, anathema, or in my Bible, it, it reads accursed. Remember these words from Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. That's the key phrase there in Galatians. He says, you're turning to a different gospel. And then he says, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So why does Paul say in one letter in Galatians, let him be accursed? And then we get to Philippians 1, and people are preaching really in, in a way that's against Paul. And all we get from Paul is, so what? Well, I love the way Chuck Swindoll explains it, and I put it into your notes. This is what he says. You can just listen. You don't even need to read it. Just listen to what Swindoll says. Isn't his, and he's talking about Paul, so isn't Paul's contrasting advice of condemnation and indifference contradictory? He says no, and the reason is simple. In Galatians, the apostle is denouncing those who garble the gospel of grace into a message of works. In Philippians, he's rejoicing that despite the impure motives of some, the good news of Jesus Christ is still being proclaimed accurately. And then I highlighted in your notes there, the message mattered most to Paul, not the messenger. Sure, he didn't enjoy hearing uh, about the selfish ambition of some, but he would not let their wrong motives rob him of the joy of Jesus being preached, end quote. Again, guys, it's all about perspective, right? Now, when you, when you really stop and think about it, there is hardly a problem in the church today that did not exist in some form in the church of the first century. I mean, we think that, uh, you know, no other era can compare with ours in all different sorts of things. And in some cases, that is the, that would probably be true. But when we think about the church, man, the early church, you talk about having it tough. My goodness, they had it tough. Case in point, <clears throat> if you remember uh, when, when, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he wrote the book of First and Second Corinthians, those, those little letters. He acknowledged in First Corinthians that the church in Corinth, in fact, was a true church in every respect. Uh, they, they were not getting uh, the same treatment that Laodicea 
uh, got, for instance, in Revelation chapter 3, Paul says that they were a legit church. In fact, the first, I think it's the first seven verses in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that the that those, Christ, uh, those Christians in Corinth were sanctified in Christ Jesus. He said they were recipients of grace. Uh, he said they were enriched in every way. Uh, he wrote uh, that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them, and he said they do not lack any spiritual gift. I mean, that's 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 pretty good, right? Yet we know that the church at Corinth was filled with problems, filled with problems. There were divisions all among the people. There were some people who said, uh, we're of the you know, Paul's party, and others said we're of Peter's party. Some said we're of Apollos's party, and then the really pious one said we're of Christ. You know, and so there's this there's this backbiting and all that. You turn over to chapter three uh, in First Corinthians, and we find that they were spiritually immature. They were unable to really digest the deep things of faith. Shoot, you go to chapter five, we find that one of those members of the Corinthian church was living in an adulterous, fornicating relationship with his stepmother. I mean, Paul had to tell him, listen, deal with that. Get that dude out of there. There were some that were still going to pagan temples. That's what they did. They, hey, they, I'm going to dip my toe here. I'm going to dip my toe here. You know, others were drunk when they would come to the communion table. Listen, they had all the problems that we have in our churches today, and perhaps even more. But what I love about Paul, and what I learned from Paul here in this letter to the Philippians, here's your fill-ins, is that he rejoiced in the message of Christ being proclaimed, even when the manner is your next fill-in, even when the manner or the method in which these detractors of Paul delivered it uh, in a very questionable way. I put in your notes, interestingly uh, enough, Paul chose not to dwell on what they did to him or what they said uh, about him as long as the gospel was advancing. Doesn't that sound like what we talked about last time? Advance the gospel, advance the gospel. You know what? I pray that that will be my heart's desire as well when we experience the same thing with people in our day. Paul understood very well the fact that when the word of God goes forth, the scripture says it will not return void, even when the motives are not pure. You remember Isaiah 55? I had to go, I had to go searching on this because I couldn't remember where it was the other day. But I found out Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. He says there in verse 11, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Yeah, guys, that just tells me once again what I already know, what you know, but we need to hear it time and time again. God is in charge. God is in charge. And when his word is preached in truth, regardless if it's from a preacher or from a talking donkey, it is his word and it is his truth. And if it advances the true gospel, we should rejoice right along with Paul. Amen. Well, you see in your notes, <clears throat> we see here in verse 15 that Paul had detractors. They were preaching Christ, it says, from envy and rivalry. But let me be very clear again. Who he's talking about, they were not heretics, nor were they false teachers. In fact, here's your feeling. They, these men were theologically orthodox. And that's not a word you probably write down every day. They were, they were spot on doctrinally. 
They were teaching the truth of the gospel. They were just mean-spirited towards Paul for some reason while they did it. They were preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ and not some other alternative gospel um, that some were getting in Corinth and in Galatia. So the word envy here really refers to the desire to deprive others of what is rightfully theirs and to wish that they did not have it, or at least they didn't they didn't have it to the full degree. They had it to a lesser degree. When you think of the word envy, think of its kissing cousin, and that's your next fill-in, jealousy. Envy is very much akin to jealousy, and it seems likely that Paul's detractors were both envious and jealous of him. What are they jealous of? We don't really know. We don't know. We can, you know, we can throw out guesses. Um, maybe they envied his giftedness. Um, maybe they envied uh, the blessings that he, that his ministry had. Maybe, uh, maybe they were jealous because he was a keen intellect. Uh, or because he was effective in ministry, maybe more so than anybody else, or maybe simply the fact that he was so highly respected and they weren't, or he was so uh, deeply beloved and they weren't, and it just sent them down this road of envy. It doesn't take much, right, to get people envious. It doesn't take much to just get people off track. Well, that's envy. Rivalry can be thought of as contention or a spirit of enmity. Enmity just means to be opposed to someone or, or to be uh, hostile to someone. They saw Paul as a competitor and somebody they wanted to defeat, somebody they wanted to be better than for some reason. And, and, and I will say, guys, one of the things that I have been frustrated by um, in my years in the church is there's still too many churches that are, they feel as if they're in competition with each other. Guys, if, 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 if the churches, the individual local churches, if they're preaching the gospel we need to have far more of a brotherhood than a competitive nature. And I don't know, I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to bring that about necessarily. Uh, prayer is a good start, obviously. Um, but again, it's, it was, it was there in Paul's day. We see a semblance of it, at least in our day. L listen to what John MacArthur writes here. He says, Paul's purpose in confronting this issue was not to gain sympathy for himself, much less to retaliate against his detractors. He was rather pointing out that faithfulness in ministry includes right motives as well as right doctrine. There have always been those uh, whose service in the church is to a large measure motivated by a desire to exceed others. That makes them resent those who are respected and whose ministries are fruitful. Such people inevitably breed envy and rivalry and thereby do great harm to Christ's church, end quote. So again, we're not privy to what it was that these men said about Paul to hurt him or, or to try to ruin his reputation, whatever it was. But whatever the charges were, they were false and unsubstantiated. Now, we need to notice here too, Paul was, Paul was not being defensive in these verses, but merely giving a correct account of the situation. Probably, maybe, because he knew that the same thing would happen to others later, and it still does today. And so, guys, I think maybe now is maybe the best time for me to, to take a quick pause. Um, and if I can be so bold and transparent with you guys, I have to confess to you that after reading this passage, uh, the Lord convicted me uh, because I have at times been just like some of those preachers 
who maligned Paul. Um, now, I, I have spoken out against some preachers who do preach a different gospel that uh, the Galatians and the Corinthians were both listening to, uh, whether it's a prosperity gospel or, or just uh, false doctrines, and I'll continue to do so um, because there is a biblical precedence for that, and there's a biblical requirement uh, to do that, and uh, uh, you know, I'll call out names uh, if I need to, and I know I've done that in the past, and I've, I've had some pushback, uh, and I've, I've made a few guys angry, uh, maybe because they <clears throat> listen to some guy on the radio or the TV or, or read his or her books and, and, uh, and I offended them. And, uh, I'm not saying I know it all, but I, I I'm going to, I'm going to take a stand where I believe God wants me to take a stand at the risk of offending a brother or sister, if that's the case. So, I've done that in the past. I'll do that again. But but here's the where the conviction came in for me. I've also said some things about others that are, I don't know how else to put it, due to an immaturity on my part. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's probably due to having an inflated or superior ego that I didn't even realize, you know, I was using at the time. Uh, fortunately, I, I've I've... Uh, never pointed anything out like that from a uh, place of prominence, from a pulpit, from a, you know, uh, a place like TGIW. But I have said some things privately and to other people that I didn't have any right to say. And as I read this passage here, it was convicting. Um, I don't believe I did any of it with intentional malice, but uh, I've also but I've done it from, again, just an immature, inflated ego that I thought, well, I knew better or I knew more uh, about what it was that uh, needed to be done or needed to be said. And uh, in those cases, I, I was absolutely wrong. I was unfair. It was sinful. And for that, I am I'm deeply saddened and sorrowful. And uh you know, there may be others that have had some of those same feelings. And this passage really brought some conviction to me. Uh, but like Paul, if the gospel is being preached in a theologically, a doctrinally sound way, I want to rejoice rather than to react from a haughty spirit. Um, and I share that with you today, just from a from a humble, repentant heart. We are not perfect. I am not perfect. But I am grateful, men, for a living word of God that still convicts and it still reproves and it still rebukes. And I am so grateful for a God who still forgives. Uh, so thanks, Paul, <laughs> for 2,000 years ago writing something I needed to to hear today. And this group that Paul is talking about, I put in your notes, it's probably a small group, but they're loud. I mean, this is, we hear that today, don't we? I mean, the minority just screams and the majority, what do we call them? The silent majority, you know? So it's probably a small group, but they were very loud and, and vocal uh, who acted like uh, this toward Paul. But he also mentions there in that first verse that there were others who preached the gospel, in his words, from goodwill. I mean, they, they didn't have anything against Paul. They didn't, they didn't have an ax to grind there. They just loved the Lord. They loved the word. They were just, they had the same motivation that Paul had. And here's your feeling. He said, they preached out of love. They preached out of love for Jesus and love for his word. And their motives, as opposed to the motives of his detractors, their motives were as pure as their messages were. So while Paul's detractors preached from selfish ambition with their own self-interest in mind, when we read verse 17, others preached out of love. 
We see that in verse 16. So it just it just begged the question. I put it on your notes. How should you and I be encouraged to preach and teach and speak the good news of Jesus Christ? It's a rhetorical question because we know how we should, but do we speak and teach and preach and evangelize in that way? Well, then we come to verse uh, 18, and 18 is really kind of an echo of the verses we looked at last time, verses 12 through 14. He says this, what then? Because of these detract, what then? What, what, what's up? What should I do? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. He's just saying again, as long as the gospel of Jesus Christ is advancing and people are hearing it and people are responding to it, it is worthy of our rejoicing, regardless of the circumstances that cause the gospel to be presented. If it's presented accurately, soundly, people are hearing it. Man, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice. But then we come to verses 19 and 20. Remember, I was going to stop at verse 18. And uh, but I got to verses 19 and 20. And then I got to 21. Um, when we get to these verses here, I put it in notes, we're already very aware that Paul is fully confident in his dependence on and dependability in the Lord despite his negative circumstances. So he is confident that God's causes would triumph. In fact, as a result of that confidence, Paul knew that he could face death without an ounce of fear. In these two verses, Paul shows his faith based on these truths and reality in these two verses. He shows his confidence in the power of the Lord, the prayers of the saints, the provision of the Holy Spirit, the promise of Christ, and the plan of God. So let's look at that real quick. Number one, what I said was Paul is confident in the power of the Lord. If we look at the first part of verse 19 and the last part, this is what Paul writes. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul's hope and his trust was that eventually God would deliver him from both physical affliction as well as false accusations. Paul knew that the power of God was on his side. In fact, several years earlier, you remember this very familiar passage, Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. And in Romans 8, 28, familiar passage. And we know that though, uh, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, Paul was simply applying that great truth to his own life right here in this passage. Paul was confident in the power of Jesus. Number two, Paul was confident in the prayers of the saints, second part of verse 19, where it says, through your prayers. Remember, he's writing this to the Corinthians, through your prayers. He, he believed in and he preached in the sovereignty of God. He had confidence in God's word and the fact that it would be fulfilled and carried out. And oftentimes that happened through prayer. And he knew that he could continue to count on the prayers of the Philippian believers because they had never stopped praying for him. So he knew he could count on that. He was confident in that. Thirdly, he was confident in the provision of the Holy Spirit, the last, uh, almost the, the last part of verse 19, where it says, the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit was Paul's resource. Guess what? That hadn't changed. He's our resource as well. For everything Paul ever needed, for everything we need, the Holy Spirit is our provider. He is the one who is there. He is the comforter. He is our guide and our power in every circumstance. He was Paul's provision. Well, he was also the first part of verse 20. Uh, we see Paul confident in the promise of Christ. It says 
the first part of verse 20, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. So Paul's eager expectation and hope that he talks about here, it was grounded in the Lord's promise. Listen, guys, this was not grounded in wishful thinking. This wasn't grounded in his expectation and hope wasn't a fingers crossed, I hope, right? He knew he could count on Jesus. If Jesus promised something, guess what? Hope equals certainty. Paul knew that he would never be put to shame and that as a living sacrifice, his body was also, according to 2 Corinthians 4.10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifested in our bodies. So Paul was confident in the promise of Christ. And finally, Paul was confident in the plan of God. And that's the latter part of verse 20. And that's where I finally realized I got to throw verse 21. I got to come to verse 21 here. He was confident in the plan of God, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I put in your notes that Paul was not brash enough to know exactly what God's ultimate plan was for him, but he was fully confident in whatever the outcome God did have with whatever plan, whether life or death. Paul's like, hey, I, I, I'm ready, and I'm more than willing, Lord. Verse 21, um, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Here's your next fill-in. Uh, many scholars believe that this verse, verse 21 of chapter 1 of Philippians, is possibly the key verse in the entire letter, the key verse. Listen to how Dr. David Jeremiah talks about this. He said, Paul stated his life's motive and mission clearly. For him to live was Christ, and to die was gain. No wonder his life had such power and momentum. He forced every experience of life through the grid of his personal purpose statement. I love that. He knew what he was all about. The suffering of his present situation was not intolerable because he saw it as a part of God's plan and his own stated purpose. When we know who we are and why we are here and where we are going, we can confidently face each day and even difficulties take on new meaning, end quote. I'm not a big Shakespeare dude at all. Um, you know, I'm, if, if you're one of those guys that likes to go to the play and the back, I'm, I will go and, and, I, and I'll probably even enjoy it, but it's kind of like Italian food. I like it, but it's way down the list for me. You know, you want to get me say, hey, you want to go eat some Mexican? You want to go eat some barbecue? Okay, that's up on my list, you know. But I do know, uh, a few little things uh, about uh, Shakespeare and some of those, some of those happen in Hamlet. If you remember the young prince wondered aloud whether or not he should relieve himself of the sorrows of life by committing suicide. When he said that famous phrase to be or not to be, that is the question. Well, you see in your notes, for Paul, the issue was simply to live as Christ and to die as gain. So I asked the question, how would you personalize Paul's message in verse 21? One of the more popular verses, one of the more well-known verses in that little book, what many scholars believe is the key verse there. How would you personalize that? Now, that next blank in your, on your sheet, that's for you to fill in. 
I'll fill in the last blank here in a second. But if you put anything after the phrase, and this is again for you to live is what? Is it to be famous? Is it wealth? Is it have to do with health, popularity, uh, power, or et cetera, et cetera? If you put anything in that blank other than Christ, then you would have to end the sentence this way. And here's your last fill in. And to die is loss. There is no gain. If that blank to live is Christ, if Christ isn't in that blank genuinely, there's, there's no way to die is gain. If you don't know Jesus, it's only loss. There is no other answer. And even for the Christian, to live is Christ. If you know Christ and you die and you, you haven't been living for him, um, but, but you know the Lord, you've established that relationship. Uh, more importantly uh, than you knowing the Lord, he knows you. Uh, yeah, you may get into heaven uh, with a little uh, singed hair on your head, you know. That's not the way to live life. Paul says, man, to live is, is Christ. The way I'm going to live my life, uh, it, everything I do is going to be run through that grid of uh, Christ-centered thought processes. But man, when I die, when, when my time is over, that's gains. That is gain. Some people see that as a great loss. Sorry for your loss. We understand that. We get that. Paul would say, man, what are you, do not be sorry for me. Do not be sorry for me because this is gain. And we realize that too for our friends and our loved ones, our family members who have died in Christ. We realize they gained it all. They gained it all. But man, it helps us to think in terms like this today. So that question is open to you. How do you personalize Paul's message in verse 21 today? That's a good way for us to, I think, end and begin this day uh, before everything goes crazy with our schedules. And let's live for Christ, with Christ, in Christ, uh, to the praise and the glory of his name today. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, again, thank you for the fact that your word still convicts. And uh, I thank you, God, that, uh, that you speak to us through your word. I pray that you would do so even now as the men are getting ready for a work day and whatnot. Lord, allow us to just meditate on your word today. Lord, we love you. And uh, we're so grateful for your guidance and your instruction in our lives. I pray, Lord, today that you might give us just a renewed confidence in you and your power and your your promises, your, your plans for us. Um, Lord, use us today, and uh, we'll give you thanks in advance for what you're going to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.